So uh, welcome to tonight's uh, photography talk. I'm Nigel Hicks, professional photographer based in the southwest of England, talking about uh, wildlife photography this evening in terms of photographing uh, insects and plants. Uh, basically, the, the small stuff we're talking about. The plants, part of it's going to be mostly flowers, though not entirely. There'd be actually some pretty big plants there as well. And the two go together quite reasonably well, insects and plants, because some of the techniques overlap. Obviously, uh, not entirely. There are also some pretty big differences as well. And um, th th I thought they worked quite well together because of those overlaps. I'm going to talk, first of all, about insect photography. I'm going to kick off really by just talking a little bit about the equipment. First of all, that's why I'm sort of talking to the screen, or talking to you rather than showing you my screen. First of all, I'm going to show you a little bit about the equipment. And the, the first problem we have, of course, with photographing insects is that, uh, well, they're really rather small. And we have a problem. We have to try and get quite close to them. And that's where we immediately run into trouble because you will find that if you try to use a telephoto lens, an ordinary telephoto lens, you just cannot get close enough to them. They'll come out rather small in the picture. And we, uh, everybody who started trying to photograph insects goes through this phase, me included, many years ago. And you find that the, uh, the minimum focusing distance of a telephoto lens is just too long. You just can't get close enough with the telephoto lens and then be able to focus. So what you need to do is to be able to use a lens which has a very short minimum focusing distance, which is an unusually short minimum focusing distance. So you can come in quite close to your subject and the lens will still be able to focus and give you quite a large subject in your, in your screen. And there are two ways to do this in terms of uh, equipment. The first is to use a uh, dedicated uh, macro lens, which is a, specifically a short telephoto lens designed specifically to fo focus very close up. And that, what they look like is really pretty much like an ordinary lens, just like I've got my set up here. This is set up with a 5D Mark IV, and then this is a 100 millimeter macro lens, which is a fairly typical kind of piece of kit that you would use for uh, a lot of close up or macro photography. The other thing you can use is an extension tube, which is really a very simple thing like this, it has no glass in it, just go, go straight to, but if I don't know if you can see, it has all the electrical connections, which uh, will, will enable the camera and the lens to talk to each other. So you can get all the, all the exposures and so on correctly uh, transferred through. And you basically can you couple this to a telephoto lens. This is a 300 mil lens. You can cu couple it to, to, the, to the back of the telephoto lens and put it between the lens and the camera body. And what that does is it moves the camera further away, or sorry, moves the lens further away from the sensor which gives uh, them more space for the light rays to focus on the, on this, on the, uh, on the sensor the, uh, in, in the camera body. And that's sort of a very good option for, you, for photographing uh, close-up subjects, sm small subjects. Obviously, it's a, a lot cheaper and a lot easier to carry around than a macro lens. Uh, not quite as versatile, but still very useful. But one of the problems we have with macro lenses or with actually with any kind of macro photography so when you're photographing insects is of course that you are going to come quite close so you, you want to come close to get them large but of course in coming quite close you're going to frighten the uh, in danger of frightening the, the the animals away and uh, the problem you then have of course is just coming in too close so you want to try and back off a little bit first way to do that if you're using a macro lens is to use a macro lens that is a at least 100 millimeters. So if you, if you find, there are several macro lenses on the market that's sort of about 50 or 60 millimeter length, focal length. Don't, don't use those in general because for work in the field at least because they, it tells you having to get really much too close to the subject. The 100 millimeter macro lens I showed you just now is kind of the minimum really for photographing small objects or insects that you might have to, uh, that might be tempted to fly away from you. Or you can use a longer telephoto, uh, so a longer macro lens with maybe a focal length of 150 millimeters or so. The one really good solution that I use frequently is so actually this solution of using an extension tube with a lot, quite a long telephoto lens. So in this case, I've shown you here the 300 mil lens that enables you to stay quite some distance away from the butterfly or some other insect uh, and still get a, a reasonable sized. Uh, subject in your frame. The one problem is that the longer your focal length, the smaller your magnification. So there is that issue. 
but uh, if one, one set against the problem of constantly frightening, uh, frightening your, your butterfly or your, or your other kind of insect away from you uh, and having to chase them around the garden all the time then, uh, or woodland, wherever it is, uh, the sort of extension tube coupled with the telephoto lens is actually quite a good compromise. So um, inevitably though, they, they will fly away quite often and you will have to keep following them around. So you're gonna to have to be mobile. So this is gonna to have to be handheld photography. Uh, and very often to do handheld photography, well, one of the other problems with, with macro photography, of course, you're coming in very close to the subject, which means that your depth of field is gonna be absolutely tiny. That is the amount of the image that is sharp is gonna be absolutely minute. The only way to maximize that depth of field is to use a very narrow lens aperture, so a high f number. Now, a high f number inevitably means quite a slow shutter speed. So you have to find ways to overcome that. One, one way, of course, is to put the ISO up, the sensitivity of your sensor. And with the latest generation of cameras, yeah, that's perfectly possible to do. The other way is to use a flash gun. And this is, this is my flash gun coupled to the top of my camera. And if I couple it with a, with a reflector, which I was hoping to show you this evening, uh, but I can't because it's got a walkabout, so I can't actually show the whole thing, you would then be able to fire a flash indirectly at your subject and light it up uh, just in front of the lens. And the problem, um, what you don't want there with, it, with, with this kind of photography is for the flash to be the dominant light source. The flash fi is fired just so that it balances with the ambient light. So you're just getting, generating just enough light to light up the subject, but light but balancing it with the ambient light what that really achieves from the photographer's point of view was first of all, first of all you might fill in some shadows that are on the front of your subject but also it enables you to overcome a little bit of camera shake and you get away with using a much slower shutter speed which is really quite uh, is very very useful so you can use a much slower shutter speed than you would ordinarily handheld with a, a big telephoto lens so it's particularly useful if you're using a telephoto lens say 300 mil telephoto lens rather than uh, a shorter macro lens. So, um, so you often using this handheld with a camera with, with a flash gun attached to it. If you have a, a camera that has a, a built-in pop-up flash, don't use that because they are they're not sufficiently versatile. They don't put out enough light or, or you, don't, you don't have enough controls. And also because they're firing along the length of the lens and your subject's very close to the end of the lens, you can end up actually putting a, sh a shadow of the lens across your subject. So if you use, much better to use one of these flash guns with a filter, with a diffuser rather over here, and then you're firing the light down onto, the, onto your subject. There's gonna be no shadow uh, from the lens going across your subject. So that's really much the best way to go. And that, this works also with, even with the big 300 mil lens as well. You, you can fire the flash over. Uh, over over the top of the lens and not get and get it onto the subject with no shadow forming there. Um, it's a little bit. What's a little bit counterintuitive, of course, is that because the flash is firing to balance the day, the ambient light. If the light levels are quite low, then the flash gun will put out just a very small amount of light. If it's a really bright sunny day, then the flash gun will put out uh, a really very powerful flash in order to try and balance with that bright, bright sunlight. So that's what something, one thing you, you often need to get used to. In fact, when it's really, really sunny, I'll often take the reflector off and just fire the flash directly. And there's a little diffuser that I put down to actually soften the light a little bit because very often I actually need all the power I can get to actually uh, fire, on, uh, fire onto the subject and balance, balance this flashlight against the, uh, against the, the sun. Um, in terms of flash, the kind of flash going to use, you want to have one which has a lot of controls in terms of being able to vary the output manually. Obviously, the flash gun will actually control the output itself as well, depending on the ambient light. But you want to be able to have overrides on that to actually be able to under or overexpose, primarily underexpose to, to decrease the power. You often will have to decrease the power quite a bit because your subject is so close to the camera. So that's really uh, the handheld photography with. Uh, a macro lens coupled with a flash or a telephoto lens with an extension tube coupled with a, with a flash. There's so a lot of trade-offs going on there, but also a lot of really uh, uh, nice little skills. It takes quite a bit of practice, especially the problems of creeping up to a butterfly or, or a bee or a or damselfly or a dragonfly or whatever. Uh, vibration on, your on the ground is a big problem, of course. Also putting a shadow across the, the subject, putting a shadow across, say, 
Uh, butterfly, you really don't want to do that because that will frighten it off straight away. And then, of course, just simply coming in too close, which, which is always a, one of the balancing acts you have with photography of, of, of butterflies. Anyway, I'm finally going to shut up on the, I'm just, just talking to you, and, and then I'm going to shape, so I'm going to share my screen now and actually show you some photographs at last, which hopefully will illustrate some of the things that I've just, uh, just mentioned. So if you hold on just a moment, let me just share the, hopefully share the right screen. And there we go. So let's go into the slideshow. Come on, doesn't want to launch. There we go. Okay, so, so uh, wildlife photography, insects and plants. And this is fairly typical of the sort of thing I've been, been talking about. This actually was photographed with the uh, 300 mil lens coupled with an extension tube. So I'm not really not too close to the insect. I'm uh, probably a meter away or something like that. And uh, so the, this butterfly of brimstone is not too, too bothered about my presence. Uh, it, it flash was fired, it's quite a sunny day and the flash was fired uh, at, at the subject. You can see, if you look at the flowers, you can see they're actually well lit up. So it's slightly harsh light on the flowers, but really not too bad. You can see there's no deep shadows anywhere. It's quite well, quite well lit. And then the butterfly itself, of course, is, is nice and evenly lit. And uh, it's, balanced very well with the background lighting as well. So you've got a really nice evenly lit uh, setup here going on. Uh, managed to get myself almost completely 90 degrees to the subject, which you really need to do because the, because the depth of field here is so small, less than a centimeter, that unless you're 90 degrees to the subject, there's a very strong possibility that uh, some part of, the, of your butterfly will go out of focus. And in fact, if you look down here, the trailing edge of the, of the wing here is starting to blur slightly. But most, otherwise, most of it is really sharp. But all flowers are almost completely sharp. And then most of the butterfly is really sharp. So I'm reasonably pleased with the success I've got here. It's really looking at um, uh, getting at most of the animal sharp. So really um, 90 degrees, right angles to, to, the, to the subject. And we're getting a, a nice flat eve nice flat subject which is mostly almost entirely sharp the, the depth of field oh sorry not depth of field, the, the um, aperture is f10 so it's going to giving us a reasonable amount of depth of field as about as much as you can get of course with uh, this kind of uh, this kind of photography moving on a different sort of uh, same, same kind of angles both still right at 90 degrees but with a butterfly with its wings wide open and flat so we've got the whole of the butterfly we immediately double the size of our subject this is a peacock butterfly. It's one of the larger butterflies we have in Britain, it's about, uh, just a bit more than two centimeters across, two and a half centimeters, I suppose. And uh, it, this is a fairly standard sort of shot that you always aim to try to get with butterflies. Again, 90 degrees to the subject so that almost everything is sharp. In fact, if I look across the butterfly, the whole animal is sharp. The background is possibly a little bit distracting as the leaves are, are, are sharp and they're going in all sorts of different directions. And that's possibly a bit distracting I think, I think it is anyway and uh, but compositionally in terms of the butterfly at least it's a really quite a successful picture this is taken with the 100 millimeter macro lens and uh, there is uh, no no flash fired on this it was uh, 40 of a second f11 the, the butterfly was completely still so f11 quite a good giving me quite a good depth of field uh, by the standards of, of macro photography uh, so the background is a little bit complex. So what we're aiming for very often is what we have here is, uh, although we've got sort of complex leaves here, the background immediately behind the butterfly is really completely flat, completely even, as it was with the first shot I showed you. So this is kind of a very much the sort of shot we, we often aim to get with, with insects, is a sort of a very simple and evenly colored background that doesn't distract from viewing the insect. Uh, no flash was fired with this one. This is and this is taken with a 300 millimeter lens plus with an extension tube. The ISO was put up for this shot. It was a, it's it's a fairly bright day, but not brilliantly sunny. So it's four, say 400 ISO, and uh, shutter speed I use. So I don't haven't recorded it here, so I'm not sure what that is. But it's a good it's a 400 ISO, obviously giving me a good enough. Oh, it's actually a hundredth of a second f upon 14, so giving me a big depth of field. But even so, here at the trailing edge, the butterfly is starting to blur out slightly. But the important areas, which is the head and thorax, and then the leading edge of the wings, these are and the points of the wings, these are all sharp. So, so a pretty satisfactory shot altogether. Coming back to a subject where the wings are folded, uh, this is a 
pearl bordered fritillary butterfly, which is a you fairly small butterfly, small pearl bordered fritillary butterfly with the wings folded. It was about one and a half centimeters across, so it's fairly small. Come into it with a, a one with a 100 mil macro lens. I've actually come had to come in quite close, uh, but no flash. So I've done quite well not to disturb it actually, and deliberately done use no flash in order to make sure I don't disturb it. And you can see I've come in again 90 degrees to the subject. The background is completely blurred out, but you can see just how small the depth of field is uh, from the antennae. I mean, the, the head and the thorax and the wings are completely sharp, but the antennae coming towards us, the antennae going into the scene is uh, blur out very, very quickly. So the depth of field is, is absolutely quite minute, only a few millimeters. However, I mean, I've talked most of the time about keeping your view as much as possible, 90 degrees to your subject. Not always, not always possible, and sometimes not always desirable either, because you want to have some variety in your pictures. And here's one where I've managed to get a shot uh, at, a, at a bit of an angle, uh, but the butterfly, nevertheless, is almost completely sharp. It's going a little bit soft on this trailing edge. Uh, you may think this butterfly is actually rather badly damaged, but it isn't. This, this is a common butterfly which, which naturally has rather ragged edges. Often, often sits on plants with its wings flat, so you can get good pictures of the butterfly with the wings flat, but here the wings are rather folded up. It's taken with uh, the 300mm lens plus extension tube and with a flash. And you can probably sit, tell that it's got a flash because it's, 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 this is very well lit up. I don't know if you can tell, but the sun is coming in kind of towards the camera from the top right of the screen. And if, if without the flash, this wing pointing towards us would be in quite deep shadow. So using the flash is really nice, provided us with some nice fill-in flash, fill-in light, which is uh, lit up this side of the wing quite nicely. Down here, you can see that actually, again, you see the flash has filled in the flowers quite nicely. Up here, everything's rather burned out. These parts of the flowers are rather burned out, but that's mostly the sunlight that has done that, not, uh, not not the flash, in, uh, and uh, I, I probably have to take my word for that. But that's really how it was with the sunlight coming in there. This, all this was burning out anyway. Uh, the flash has actually provided some filling light here. I don't think it's caused these areas to burn out, but it has put some nice light into the wing of this common butterfly here. And then a background completely flat green, which is a, a forest behind it, which is really quite, quite nice. Now we come on to this kind of shot. Uh, two butterflies mating. Uh, the great thing about having two butterflies while they're mating is that you, you, you greatly increase the size of your subject, which when you're photographing a very small butterfly such as this, uh, is a, a really a great, uh, great godsend. So the, these are common blues and they're, they're barely a centimetre across, a bit more than a centimetre across each one from the, he from the head to the tips of their, their wings. Uh, so they're really very small, quite difficult to get close enough to to get uh, uh, really effective shots. But when they're mating, they, they double in size, of course. And also, they become much less likely to fly away when you come too close to them. So uh, much more predictable and stable subject to shoot. Uh, stable, except for the fact that on this particular day, it was really very windy. So the plant that these, uh, butterflies, was on, these butterflies were on was waving around quite considerably. And I had to take a lot of shots to get a few that were sharp. And I didn't use a flash, amazingly. I, I would have thought I would have in this kind of situation, but I didn't. <laughs> I used uh, it's a, a, a 600 millimeter lens, would you believe, with a plus an extension tube. And I use a 500th of a second, partly because of the, uh, the long focal length I've used, and also the the fact that the insects, the butterflies, are blowing around in the wind quite a bit. So I needed to use quite a pretty fast shutter speed to to freeze the movement. Also, of course, as I say, 600 millimeter lens with uh, extension tube and no flash means that I need to have a, uh, a fast shutter speed, even though I've got image stabilization switched on on the lens, I need to have a reasonable, reasonably fast shutter speed just to uh, make sure I don't, cap don't get camera shake. But again, uh, I'm, in terms of composition, I'm really at uh, 90 degrees to both butterflies, so it's sharp almost all the way across. There's a little bit of softness here and there, but basically both butterflies are sharp apart from their antennae. And then the background is completely blurred out, and that's so. Uh, this is one of my favourite butterfly compositions, of one of my favourite butterfly shots, I have to say. So, I uh, said this is. Uh, I'm really very pleased with this particular picture. Now, move on a little something a little bit different to the caterpillars. Um, 
caterpillars can make quite nice subjects partly because of course they don't fly away and they don't crawl away particularly quickly either so that, that's all it makes it quite handy the problem is they're usually very small this particular one is is, is not it's a couple of centimeters long but the problem with caterpillars of course apart from being very small is they're long and narrow rather like a snake and a long narrow subject doesn't always doesn't doesn't very often make a particularly good composition but in this instance it has made a reasonably good composition because it's going around in quite a nice curve so it's giving us a nice curving shape to the composition uh, that uh, in turn though has given us a depth of field problem because in, in the, the top half of the caterpillar is nice and sharp but then as it goes into the curve it, it blurs out which is a little bit sad but it would have been nice to get the whole shot the whole uh, whole caterpillar sharp but unfortunately not not to be but anyway so this was taken with a 100 millimeter macro lens and no flash, so it's 80 of the second, but only F5, so very small depth of field, hence you see this blurring out here on this, on this curve. So now we're going to move away from butterflies and come on to damselflies, or in this case, uh, demoiselle. And this is one taken in bright sunlight, and even though it's, and it, or even though it's bright sunlight, I've used a flash on this, it's a 300 mm lens with, a, with an extension tube, and I've used a flash to put in some fill-in light on the wings. Uh, and so you can see the wings are very nicely lit up. Uh, the leaves are reflecting the sunlight quite a bit, not the flash, but the sunlight. So that, that's a little bit distracting. So I've taken it, then moved forward on with a rather different composition, which is this, which is actually backlighting. So the sun is actually coming towards the camera and the blackness there is a forest or woodland, perhaps I should say, which is completely in shadow and, and completely underexposed. There's no flash has been fired in this instance. It's just really just the sunlight shining through the wings and uh, and lighting up for, uh, lighting up those wings there and actually lighting most I think that sunlight must be coming down from top right so it is actually lighting up the thorax as well and lighting up these these, these the, again the leaves are a bit distracting but the composition of the of the, of the damselfly is really rather uh, of the, actually the damselfly is actually really very attractive and sharp all the way from the head all the way through to the tip of the uh, abdomen as well so quite quite well executed i think now i'm going to show you a sequence of shots with these with a pair of uh, damsel flies here again a pair of mating so nicely doub doubles the size of my subject and this sequence is about not just trying to get the comp the uh, actual composition and focusing of the subject right but actually also what's called the negative space everything else that's not the subject so the background in particular in this instance and so we've got a, you know, quite a nice composition here, except to say that although the bodies of the two uh, damselflies are sharp, the wings are blurring out quite quickly, and the background is really, really distracting. It's, it's, this leaf here is very, very bright, it's got a lot of sunlight on it. The sun is, uh, is backlighting our subject here. You can see the shadow of the, of the, of the damselflies here. So the sun is coming from, be, from uh, towards the camera, so shining up from, the, from behind the, uh, the damselflies, and it's really lighting up these leaves here as well. Uh, no flash is used with, with any of the pictures in this sequence, and it was all taken with very high ISO, so 1,000 ISO, and 5 hundredths of a second, because, uh, again, shooting with a 600 mil lens plus an extension tube. So anyway, this is the first shot in the sequence. I then move on, and then now, this time managing to uh, get completely perpendicular at right angles to the to the two damselflies. Remember, the, see from the last shot, I was at a bit of an angle to them, so the wings are going rapidly out of focus. In this one, I'm really at right angles, and uh, so getting better focus. The, the bodies are focused all the way through, and the wings are sharp. Most, part of the way through, at least half of the way through, he's going off a little bit here and going off here. But we still got this really distracting background, this brightly lit leaf behind. So we're going to keep on trying, we're going to try and get a, a, an image where we've got as much of the damselflies as possible sharp and got rid of this really distracting background. So the next image in the sequence is actually in terms of co composition of the damselflies at worst actually, we come around to a different angle to try and move that distracting green, brightly lit green away from the picture and kind of manage that into some extent. But uh, now the the wing, the composition's all wrong. The damselfly's body is not too bad, but the wings are really, really blurred. So then comes the final shot where I've gone back to the idea of being perpendicular to the damselflies, but I managed to get myself into a position where the, uh, the background 
uh, green is completely gone. We've got a completely black background. The black again being a uh, forest that is in shadow, no sunlight on it at all. So it's gone completely underexposed. And we've just got the sunlight uh, backlighting these, these damselflies and, uh, and lighting them up like this. So we end up uh, with the, sort of the final composition that I'm satisfied with. And then move on to uh, final damselfly shot again to uh, to, to mating, actually producing a really nice composition, which actually really has quite a nice meaning for us. Again, damselflies have this problem being rather long and narrow, but if you've got two together in this, uh, in, in the mating shape, then you've actually got this really nice sort of heart shape, perhaps a little bit circular, I might say, but mainly heart shape. And take them with the background also completely uh, blurred out. Uh, the, the, the light, the background is, is sunlit as well as the uh, subject. So, I've got lighting fairly even across the whole scene. No flash was fired here. This was just taken with a 100 millimeter macro lens. Again, as with those bus butterflies that are mating, much less the two damselflies that are mating, much less inclined to fly off uh, if you get too close. So uh, again, it becomes a little bit easier to, to photograph. And then single shot of a dragonfly. Dragonflies by insect standards are quite large, so you can, it is possible to get quite nice, really close cropped pictures. This was taken with a 600 mil lens with, a, with an extension tube, so enabling me to come in really very close without actually being too close to the, to the dragonfly. Uh, surprisingly, it's just, it's just sunlight. There was no flash fire there, so it's all lit up by sunlight. And 600 mil lens are saved, so very, quite a high ISO to get, get the shutter speed that I needed. It's a 320th of a second, so not that fast a shutter speed for such a big lens, uh, but the ISO is 1600. Uh, the, and actually the uh, lens aperture is f16 so i'm really getting the maximum aperture i can get which is uh, so maximum depth of field that i can possibly get which is what you really need with uh with, with such a close shot we're gonna have a tiny tiny depth of field but now as you get all the thorax and head sharp obviously it's then starting to go off when you come down to the abdomen down here and on the wings as well but the main part of the picture is all completely sharp which is actually really what uh, what i needed and that's the, that's the f16 was achieving that coupled with a relatively fast shutter speed and a high iso to, to enable make that possible okay so that really is the end of the, of the insect photography I'm going to move on to photograph plants and of course plant photography ranges all the way from things like this or bordering landscape photography, where you're really looking at a whole forest and big, big plants, all the way right down to small flowers and, uh, and mosses and, and uh, lichens and so on. So I'm going to talk about mostly the, the flower stuff, so relatively small, a little bit about fo forest photography and, and, the, and, and large plant photography. Obviously, with this kind of thing, with plants, fortunately, they don't, uh, they're not going to run away or fly away, but they do move around in the, in the breeze, so that can create a few problems. But the fact that they don't run away does tend to mean that you will be much more likely to use a tripod and use a slow shutter speed whenever possible to give you a big depth of field, so a high F number, a big depth of field. Uh, don't use a flash very often. Very rarely use a flash on, on in, in plant photography these days uh, because it, it, do, it does tend to give quite harsh shadows around the, around the plants. And especially for photographing white flowers can be really quite problematic with, with burnout. Uh, I know some people do use a flash for photographing plants, especially scientists who really are only interested in pictures that enable them to give uh, ID shots of the species they're not really after something that's artistic and, and so on. So this particular picture then just taken with a tripod. Um, uh, actually, I think it's handheld because it's 80th of a second. Just looking at the data here, it's actually 80th of a second. But f4.5, so the lens, lens is wide open. So uh, should be a fairly small depth of field, but I've used a wide angle lens. So it's, so it's not, the depth of it actually is not too bad. So that's kind of the sort of thing I have with a whole forest kind of picture. Another kind of angle that you might use in a forest to actually focus in on the, on the plants more, focusing on the big trees anyway, is to actually point the camera straight up. And then on a, if you're shooting on a sunny day, which is what I would use, use this kind of shot for, you're basically getting backlighting of your, of your, of your plants, of the, of the leaves on the trees. So the sunlight is, is shining through those leaves and lighting them up really rather nicely. I wouldn't do this on a gray day because it doesn't really work very well. The, this, 
I, I, as much as I, as much as possible, I really would avoid doing it because that that grey sky would come out awfully white and burned out, and it would not look great with the with the leaves. So really, on a sunny day, point the camera straight up and give you give yourself some really nice backlit leaves. Again, it's this is a wide angle lens, and uh, this is handheld 80th per second f 4.5. But then quite often when you're shooting inside a forest, the best kind of light you can have is really quite flat, soft light. And that's what I've done here uh, in tropical rainforest in the Philippines, just really concentrating on the base of a tree and the rattans growing around, around that tree and with soft flat light, you got really strong greens and nice shapes and no bright highlights and deep shadows interfering with the composition. This is definitely taken with the camera on a tripod. And it's given to be an F22, so a big depth of field and a 10 second exposure. So it gives you an idea really of uh, how sort of just how soft the light was or how flat the light was. It really, really was, uh, the lighting really was quite low in, in the forest there. Anyway, then we start coming in closer and uh, in onto the leaves. And we're now shooting with a macro lens. This is a 100 millimeter. Uh, macro lens, this is handheld, so 50th of a second f6.3, so getting a pretty small depth of field, not much of the picture is sharp. And uh, if you look here, only this part of the picture is, is sharp, everything else is starting to blur out. So that's, I've done that deliberately, it's not purely by, not by accident, I wanted to concentrate your attention on this part of the picture, leaving all the other areas to sort of go into a blur, so be, be hopefully a little less distracting, your attention will come onto these leaves here. Um, so obviously that, that's sort of the idea there, it's a small depth of field, I have hand, say half, half handheld, it's 50th per second using a 100 millimeter macro lens. Something a little bit different, again in flat light, same as before, is uh, in a vineyard. This time I've actually used a tripod, uh, 20 is the second F9, and using F9, deliberate, deliberate choice here, I've worked out that it's actually uh, giving me a depth of field that's big enough to get all the grapes sharp, but uh, shallow enough that the leaves behind the grapes are starting to blur out. So it's making sure that your concentration or your attention is drawn to the, to the grapes and, and less so to the leaves, the leaves become really just part of the, of the backdrop. So this is the sort of thing you might do close up in uh, in, in flat light. So using a, a macro lens again, but coming in coming in reasonably close. And then finally, uh, well, actually not fine, finally, but another flat light shot. This is very soft lighting. This is a, a, a flower. Actually, the scientific name is Barringtonia racemosa, but uh, I'm not sure what the English name is. I'm not sure there is is an English name. It's uh, as you can see, it's a beautiful pale pink and white flower, uh, which is just stunningly beautiful and difficult to photograph because it flowers only at night. And as soon as the morning comes, uh, the, the flowers are shed and they fall off to the ground. Actually, not the ground because this is a, is a, these grow on a tree, a small tree that grows only in swamps. So these will fall off into water. And of course, it's a, it, the access to the plants is quite difficult. Getting to see the flowers is, is very difficult. You've got to be out there really first thing in the morning. And I was lucky here because I was staying at a, at a resort actually whose uh, bungalows were built in the swamp on, on stilts in the swamp and in among these trees with all these flowers hanging down. And it was even, early, even in the morning, once it was daylight, it was still quite dark in under the shade of these trees and the flowers stayed hanging in place uh, for a little bit longer than they might otherwise do if they were out in, in brighter lights. And so I was able to get this shot. It's handheld because of the walkway was almost a bit slippery. I don't really want to felt, feel safe setting the tripod off, tripod up. So I've used a very high ISO, 1000, 1000 ISO, uh, with an ordinary telephoto lens, no need for macro here, because this is actually quite large, and 80th of a second with f7.1. So not a big depth of field, but big enough to get the, all the flowers sharp with, with the leaves behind blurring out. Anyway, then we come to start photographing flowers in sunlight and often prefer not to do flowers in sunlight unless it's quite soft sunlight because uh, in sunlight you often get bright highlights and deep shadows and uh, uh, that's always a big danger, especially with white flowers as I'll show you in a moment. But this one is uh, this beautiful yellow flower called Bog Asphodel, grows in boggy areas in, in uh, southwest of England. It's uh, 
lit up with quite soft sunlight coming in from the right, which I've then softened still further with a bit of uh, post photography processing in the computer, which has lifted some of the shadows a bit and dampened down a few highlights, and ended up with this uh, with this uh, composition. And one of the problems with with photographing flowers, as you would have seen in that last shot, is that uh, they are they can be quite complex and can have quite um, big uh, three-dimensional shapes, which can make uh, the depth of field issue quite a, quite a big issue. So uh, you will need to try and maximize your depth of field with a lot of these uh, pictures, especially when you've got a clump of flowers like this. So here, this one, I've used uh, f22, so narrow, very narrow lens aperture to try and get the maximize the amount of picture that's sharp. And it's 13th of a second, so the camera is definitely on a tripod. And using a 100 millimeter macro lens come in really nice and close and making sure that all the background despite using a very narrow lens aperture the whole of the background is completely blurred out so you really concentrate just on the flowers here this area here over here on the right is perhaps a little bit distracting but I don't worry about it too much I think your concentration really is on the flowers here and then this next shot I just wanted to show you two different shots of the same flower it's a rock rose uh, photographed uh, on uh, Berry Head near Brixham in, in South Devon. Uh, one moment in bright sunlight, then in flat light. It was one of those days where the sunlight was coming and going, so I was able to photograph the same flower twice from exactly the same position. And you can see the, re the real difference between the two types of flower. This one on the left in bright sunlight, the sun actually coming towards the camera. You see the shadow here is actually coming towards the camera. The white is very, very bright. In fact, very often white flowers will burn out in bright, bright sunlight like this. This hasn't quite happened on this flower, but it's come pretty close. And you've got deep shadows there as well. But it is quite bright. It's quite attractive. And um, it's, it really looks you know, not too bad. Over here, it's very flat, soft lighting. It uh, initially looks a little bit dull in comparison to the sunlit one, and, and, and the, the edge, the blurred edge of the leaves kind of show, tend to show up a little bit more. But we don't have any deep shadows there at all. It's all quite evenly lit. And this beautiful yellow in the middle of the flower shows up much better than it does over here because of the shadows coming from the stamen. So uh, it, I'm not saying one flower is, well, so one photo is necessarily better than the other. It kind of possibly comes down to your own personal choice in the end. I personally do actually prefer the, the soft lights, the flower shot in the soft light to the, to the sunlit one. The sunlit one's a little bit too complicated and busy, whereas this one over here is a little bit simpler. Um, both images were shot with, with a, not a particularly narrow um, lens aperture. This one actually on the right was shot only with f7.1, so fairly wide open aperture, but hence some of the pe some of the petals have actually blurred out along their edges. But it's uh, if you're concentrating attention on the on the centre of the flower, and actually that works really rather nicely. Next uh, two shots are actually comparison of the same flower, bee orchid, photographed in different lighting. Again, this is flat light, really quite nicely evenly lit all the way across. Got a little bit of uh, focusing is going off a little bit on the petal over here and up here, but basically but the most important part of the flower here is that has actually come out really very nice and very sharp and the petal nearest the camera also is, is really very sharp as well. Compare that with the next shot which is this uh, sunlit picture with the sun coming from behind pointing coming towards the camera so backlighting the petals it's a very different kind of picture and so the sun is shining through the petals and then the, the Central part, central part of the flower here is a bit dull and, and flatter and it's not really catching much light so it doesn't really catch your attention quite so much it's the petals that really capture your attention here if you go back to the previous shot then this one you actually your attention really comes to the, the central part of the flower much more than the petals whereas in this one your attention is on the petals which catching catching the sunlight rather than the central part of the flower anyway move away very briefly from flowers to just to grasses and show that this, this backlighting technique is good, not just with flowers, but also with other plants as well. So always keep your eye out for this kind of thing. So really nice backlighting on these on, on the grasses here with the light coming into the, the whiskers and really giving us a nice sort of, uh, uh, sort of brightly lit aura around the edges of the, of the seeds. And this was, uh, this one is handheld, 200th of a second, f upon eight. Just taken with a macro lens, but this, the sunlight is so bright, I've been able to use quite a fast shutter speed and just hand, hand hold it really rather well. 
And then we come to a rather complex uh, flower. This is a Medinua flower, something from the Philippines. So it's really, it's a complex of mass of flowers and it's very difficult to get a meaningful photograph out of it. Put the camera on a tripod and use a very narrow lens aperture to get a big depth of field. Uh, but it's, it's so, so all the flowers are sharp, but it really is a be, very busy, busy sort of picture. Instead, might might be better to actually home in on just the, really the central part of the flower, just the stamen, and just show how quite amazing they are. It's really very complex, soft lights. This wouldn't work in bright sunlight because these white petals would really go too, too bright and, and possibly burn out. And we'd have highlights and deep shadows all over the place. This element in the background here, a bit distracting, would be nice to have this a bit more blurred than it is, but nevertheless, your attention is, is held reasonably well by the stamen and it works, I think, reasonably well. Next, I'm going to show you a sequence of pictures with, uh, with rhododendron flowers, obviously quite a big flower, so you don't need really a macro lens to photograph the flower itself, but if you want to come in on the detail, then you do need a macro flower, a macro lens. So first of all, it's taken this whole sequence, the flat, the, all the images are taken on a tripod using f upon 20, so a very narrow lens aperture giving us a big depth of field using the 100 millimeter macro lens. Side on, and it's giving uh, all the state, well, almost all the stamen in this particular flower, uh, a sharp, some stamen on the, on the flower behind are blurred, but stamen on this particular flower are all sharp. Uh, and there's also the pattern in the petals are sharp. So giving us a good depth of field is actually sharpening across the whole part of the flower that we're, we're concentrating on. If we then look at the, the same flower front, uh, frontally, we're getting a reasonable depth of field, F upon 20, it's enough to actually give all the stamen sharp. And then also the petal here sharp. So, so the most important areas of the, of the flower are completely sharp. You can see as we go into the funnel of the, of the flower, that starts to blur out. But that's not surprising. If you look, go back to the previous picture again, you see that the, the, the funnel of the flower is a long way behind the stamen and, and the pattern on the petal. It's got the pattern on the petal and most of the stamen are in pretty much a similar plane, whereas the funnel is a long way back. So this picture, these are in the same plane. They're, they're getting quite sharp and then in the funnel, it's really starting to blur out. Next shot, we're actually moving in much, much closer. And now we have, uh, we're still managing to get most of the stamen sharp. A few of them are starting to blur out here, a little bit of blur out, but still managing to get sufficient depth of field, a few millimeters, maybe a centimeter to get most of the stamen sharp, which is quite nice. But then when we go on to looking at the, uh, the flower frontally, we're not managing to get everything sharp. There's too much depth going on. The, uh, the stigma here is actually completely blurred out and then, and then only a few of the stamen are sharp, the others are blurring out and the pa pattern is sharp. But so we sh we've focused on this plane, but not much of the rest, not much of the rest of the flower is actually sharp, not much of it is in that plane and, and everything else is blurring out. So that's uh, the real problem as you come in closer, so your depth of field gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If you go in really close, then you start to really struggle with getting everything uh, sharp, everything that you need to have sharp, as sharp as you can. And then finally, the final set of pictures cover another uh, technique. What I've covered, you with you, covered with you so far is really just you coming in close to a, to, to a plant, to a flower, and just showing you this kind of thing that we have on the left, just a close-up shot of the flower, uh, and just showing you this, the flower structure, not showing anything about its environment. You can also do this shot, this type of technique on the right, which uh, is taken with a wide angle lens, which in coming in really close to the flower, as close as the lens will allow you to, uh, and so you're getting a wide view, shows the flat plant, not as close as you can on the left, of course, but showing you the plant and then its environment as well. Uh, this is taken with a 40 millimeter lens, coming into about 20 centimeters or so from the plant. And to do this successfully, you've got to have a wide angle lens with a, a quite a short minimum focusing distance, which uh, I have with the Canon 17 to 40 mil lens. Most wide angle lenses don't have a, a short a fo minimum focusing distance, which is short enough to make this work. But uh, if you do have one, then uh, this is a technique that you, you can make a good use of. Obviously, if you've got a set of flowers that are big enough, then you can use it quite, quite easily to actually get a really uh, striking composition. In this case, uh, fox gloves, of course, are really quite huge and you can use a wide angle lens to come in and get a really good, strong comp uh, composition, which shows both the flowers and their environment. 
but usually you're doing if you're using the wide angle lens you're doing this kind of thing using a whole set of flowers in this instance a group of uh, of great knapweed and a, um, a pyramidal orchid uh, showing the environment they're growing in which is basically is, is limestone grassland but on, on the coast again this is berry head at brixham on the south coast of devon um, the fact it's on the coast is incidental it is actually just uh, limestone grassland is the important point lit up by evening sunlight coming in on the right here and um, this actually is is handheld but it managed to use 40th per second and f10 so mo moderate depth of field most of the background is blurred out but the what i wanted to have sharp namely these three plants well, these three flowers are all completely sharp and that's given me a really quite a nice composition this tells and combined with the environment it tells us quite a lot about those flowers and, and the environment they grow in however if you then switch to the macro lens and, and home in on one of these flowers you end up with this kind of shot which is really a, a nice detailed picture of the one flower but tells you nothing about the environment that it's growing in again this is handheld because quite a lot of sunlight available uh, 60th per second 100 millimeter macro lens is f7.1 so depth of field is not huge but some, some parts of the plant are some parts of the flower are not are not sharp and then just show you this once again marsh marigolds on dartmoor uh, uh, macro lens homing in on just the one flower giving us quite a nice detail most of the background completely blurred and then switching to the 17 to 40 millimeter lens giving us a wide angle view showing not showing just homing in focusing on these two uh, flowers here but then showing us the wider environment around it around us around, around them i should say so give it showing us a good bit about the environment and the sort of kind of uh, uh, features that they, they grow, grow in or the landscape they grow in and then finally finally same kind of thing a detailed shot with the macro lens uh, handheld of um, of sea holly just coming in really close on this beautiful flower and then switching to the wide angle lens to show not just the sort of whole plant but its environment and indeed quite a famous location so just really setting the environment setting the scene for the kind of place where you would find this this, this plant growing right on the beach so that really is kind of summarizing uh, everything about the, well, a lot about the plant photography flower photography and also some introduction to uh, insect photography as well Finally, there's just the usual thing about my books, which are for sale in shops and online at uh, nigelhicks.com. And then details of things that are coming up, further online talks. The next online talk is the 19th of May, which will be architectural photography. And uh, I noticed that I'm sort of running out of the list that I created a few months ago. So I'll be coming up with a new list fairly soon. If anybody has any ideas for uh, subject matter they'd like me to cover, then please let me know and I'll see if, uh, if I can fit it in. And then uh, in terms of photography courses, the next one is this uh, weekend, 24th of April, wildlife photography out on Exmoor, photographing red deer and hopefully dippers. There's just one place left on this course. So if you'd like to come along, get in touch or just go to the website and book your place and, and, uh, and I'll see you there. The next course after that is 16th of May, which is architectural photography and that will be in Bath. So that's, uh, that's it. So I'll stop there. And... Uh, uh, we'll have some questions and if, hopefully we'll have some questions and if you want to uh, switch your microphones and cameras on then uh, we can have a have a little chat hopefully I need a drink oh, I'm still showing my screen aren't I Stop sharing. That's it. That's what I want to do. Sorry. I thought I stopped sharing the screen and I hadn't. Okay, anybody got any questions? Do you want to, want to jump in first again? Yeah. Okay, Mike. Yeah. Uh, have you got any views on can you use an extension uh, tubes with macro lenses? What is that sort of. Oh, uh... uh, yes. Yes. So that's. Uh, one thing I forgot to say, yes, you can put the extension tube with the macro lens as well. So that will actually increase the magnifying power of the of the macro lens too. So you can do that. Yeah. Hmm. Um, it just obviously you end up with with, um, with quite a short focusing distance. So you end up being quite close to your subject. That's the only problem, the risk you have there. Okay. And if no one else got a question, I've got one other one, if I may. Yeah. 
I think carry on for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Keep keep going. Yeah. Um, <laughs> got any views on uh, focus stacking software? Ah uh, yes, I've d I have i deliberately didn't cover that this evening because that's really a whole a whole other. Uh, well, th there's your awesome <laughs> talk then. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point. And I'd probably I'd better go on and study it a bit more with myself. Actually, I. I've 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 tried it a few times and done with it. It does work quite well, but it does suffer a little bit from uh, from some artifacts if you're not careful. I think you use have to stack an awful lot of layers to actually make sure you don't get some artifacts creeping in. So uh, I should, I'm going to have to practice that with more with that. Um, obviously, it doesn't. Well, it's a risk that it is not going to work so well with with butterflies and things that are going to move and fly away very quickly especially if you're, you yourself are hand-holding as well, because you're going to move too. So it's going to be a tricky one with subjects that are moving or if you're moving. So, uh, But certainly for static subjects and if the camera's on the tripod, then yes, it, it, it ought to work. Yeah. Okay, anybody else want to ask some questions? Want to sort of um, unmute the microphone and say and, and uh, turn your camera on if you want to ask a, ask a question. Can you tell me, do you use autofocus when you're... Um photographing the insects or are you manual focus? Oh yeah, good question. You're usually, well, uh, if I'm using a macro lens, it's usually autofocus, uh, uh, provided I can get it to focus, provided I can get the lens to focus on the right part of the butterfly. Sometimes it doesn't, that, it just won't do it and it's, uh, it will focus on the bit it, it wants to focus on, which is not the part I wanted to focus on, so then I'll switch to manual focus. With uh, a telephoto lens coupled with a, an extension tube, it's often better to turn the autofocus off and focus manually, or actually just zoom yourself in and out. You tend to, um, and I said one thing I didn't cover at all, is that it's a, if you're using a telephoto zoom lens, it's best just to fit your, uh, turn the autofocus off and use the zoom on, on the lens rather than the autofocus. Otherwise, uh, it, it becomes a lot easier because sometimes the autofocus won't work terribly well to the extension tube. If you're, if you're using a fixed focal length uh, 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 telephoto lens like I usually do, then you're better off either moving yourself in and out into focus or focusing manually with a with manual focus on the lens. Yeah. Oh. Anybody else? Um, the, the, uh, this work, especially with insects, takes a, a lot of practice and you will get a lot of uh, uh, failures, get a lot of bad pictures. I've had thousands over the years. You kind of get used to it. Um, it it's all part of, the, uh, part of the process really is, uh, is failure. So <laughs> but it, over time, you build up enough successes to actually be able to say that it is actually working. And uh, I have to say that the more, the, uh, the more I do it, the luckier I get. So uh, I, if, I, if I go through phases where I'm doing it a lot, like if I've got a specific project on, then I get better and better at it. If I then don't do it for a while, then suddenly I find that I'm really struggling to photograph insects. So, uh, so uh, don't be disheartened if you struggle to start with when you first start doing it. It's, it, it, it can be a nightmare. And, and one of the first, one of the, one of the big uh, bugbears is just having to be, finding yourself having to get too close to the insects and they, and they just fly off. So hence the sort of the combination of the longer telephoto lens with the extension tube can work uh, exceptionally well, especially if you're, you're new to the, to the process and are finding it difficult to, to get close to your subject. Any more questions? No, well, if, if, if there's not, then... Uh, I've got one for you, but I'm not quite sure what the question is, except... Um, <laughs> Hi, Mark, right. Except about flashy or flash guns. Can you okay. tell us about flash guns in terms of, um, you know, what their capabilities, what type of prices, uh, any recommendations about what to buy, that type of stuff? Yeah, I'm not really up to date on what's on the market, I have to say, but basically you need to uh, have one that will... Um, well, to be able to have it have a sort of multi-use, uh, I would go for the best one you can afford, really, or actually the best that's available, even. But sort of a, like a flash gun that can fire up to up to about fifteen meters, which obviously has a good ETTL, that is electronic TTL through the lens metering, which pretty well all the flash guns have these days. So that, that you you take all the legwork out of uh, balancing the flash power with the ambient light, the flash does all, does all that. But also being able to um, the, the, the flash gun will, will automatically quench its, its output power according to the, uh, the, the ambient light and also to some extent how close your subject is. 
and how bright your subject is as well. But you may find that with a, with a subject that's really close to you, you need to actually manually quench the, the, the flash yourself. So you need to have have that option on the on the flash gun as well to be able to sort of manually under under expose. I, was, I suppose you would say the, the power of the flash, to dial the flash down manually yourself um, below what it was. The flash gun can already do itself automatically. So that's quite an important option. Um, so yeah, and also uh, well you. In this photography, mostly you're going to be using a telephoto lens, so so you need to have a zoom which will work for, with telephoto lenses, which is fairly standard. And also, most good telephoto lenses actually also actually have an automatic setting, so it will vary. If you're using a wide-angle lens, it will give you a wide a wide a wide beam. Obviously, you need to have a much wider beam if you're using a wide-angle lens than you do if you're using a telephoto lens, and it will automatically adjust for that. But uh, that doesn't really apply to this kind of photography because you're going to be using a telephoto or macro lens most almost all the time anyway. Okay, it's far it's far more complex than I thought then quite clearly. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, just research what's on the market now and sort of go for a good one. Uh, don't, uh, but obviously don't 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 break the bank with with, with it. They're, they're not generally not hugely expensive. Um, do you have to do you have to keep it with the body in terms of its its manufacture or can you vary that? Uh, say that again. Sorry, what do, what do you mean? You have to match your camera body with the lens, you know, the manufacturer. Can you vary? Uh, it, it, you don't have to, but I would advise it because then you would be completely assured of uh, of complete compatibility. Okay, cool. Thanks, yeah. mate. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Talking of flashes, do you um, use okay. a ring flash at all? Um, that's just something I was going to mention. I don't use a ring flash because I don't like the quality of light that they put onto the subjects. Uh, yeah, a lot of people use or can recommend using a ring flash, which is a literally a, a flash gun that is a ring that fits on the, around the around the front end of your lens, uh, and that's been quite popular in fashion photography actually over the last few years. And you can use it in macro photography at all as, as well. You can use it in macro photography as well. And of course, there's no risk of putting a shadow across shadow of the lens across your subject. The one problem I, I think about it is that it does you put quite a harsh light on your subject and I don't particularly like it for that reason. But yeah, you, you could re use a ring flash. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Okay, great. All right, well, if everybody's sort of, uh, sort of satisfies either that or overwhelmed with all the questions one or the other, <laughs> all the technical stuff. I'm going to call it call an end there, unless there's any more questions. No. So, thanks so much for your time tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a, it's a bit of a whistle stop talk for everything. I think uh, the next series of talks that come up, coming up in the second half of the year will look at a few of the these things I've covered over the last six months in a little more detail, so that we sort of cover uh, a smaller subject but in more detail rather than sort of whistling around a whole mass of, st of stuff so that's what we'll probably we'll be doing in the in, in the second half of the year and uh, hope to see you again uh, online uh, shortly and uh, hopefully on a in, on a uh, workshop a real proper workshop which is now up and running we had the first one last weekend so um, fingers crossed that they will continue and get uh, more numerous okay so thank okay. you very much and uh, talk again soon Please. thanks bye bye yeah good night bye 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 thank you Nigel bye